So the first question tonight, please advise course of action to one who is weary of samsara but is too old to become a monastic. You're never too old to become a monastic because in the, where was it, somewhere in the suttas, there was this one gentleman, 120 years of age, he ordained. And uh, ordaining 120 years of age, about three months later he cracked, he became fully enlightened and a couple of months later he died. So it's leaving it to the last moment but he managed to squeak in <laughs> and get it and before he died. The only problem these days is you know that you know we haven't got that many monasteries for, for Westerners unfortunately and sometimes if it's lots of old monks or old nuns that sometimes the, the young monks or young nuns spend all the time looking after the oldies and so they don't have time to practice themselves. So because of that it's <coughs> build more monasteries, the more monasteries the more opportunities there are for you. And anyway if you can't do this life you can build a monastery now and then, for like a nice nuns monastery, a nice place, and then, as you die, you make the determination, in my next life, I will become a nun and ordain with Bhikkhuni Chanda, who by that time will be very, 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 very old. <coughs> 120. Dear Ajahn people who do ritualistic animal killings, e.g. Muslims that I believe there is merit in that, as they will not have guilt over their actions, does this mean they will get a lesser repercussion? If so, is ignorance better to get a better karmic outcome? It's, you must say that it will be less of a karmic outcome in the same way the Western law understands that if you are drunk, uh, if you are incapacitated in some particular way, then there is a little bit less culpability. I think it's usually manslaughter rather than murder. Uh, however, there may be less merit, but it doesn't mean that a less merit means that it can be done. Uh, sometimes, even in mon monastic life, we tell monks, look, it's only a small offence. But even small offences are important. You don't, say, I don't say it's only a small offence. No, that only the small offences are important. So, it does mean it's less a repercussion, but there's still repercussion. But of course, a lot of them know it's wrong. They feel it's wrong. They may try and hide it, but it's wrong. What is the role of renunciation as a Buddhist monastic in the path of Nibbana? Could lay people just as easily become enlightened? Lay people can get enlightened, but... For example, you want to go and visit me in Australia. It's much easier to go on an aircraft than walk to, um, to Calais I walk to Dover and then swim across the English Channel and then walk all the way over Europe and the Middle East and uh, through India and then <coughs> down uh, over the Bangladesh into Burma and from Burma over to Thailand and Thailand down to Singapore and there you have to sort of probably get a ferry uh, over to Bhutan and then through Indonesia and then from there go into the little islands and then to Darwin and from Darwin then walk uh, to, uh, to Perth. <coughs> that's, that's possible. It can be done. But it's not recommended when there's an easy way. Renunciation, of course, of course it's the easy way, especially as a Buddhist monastic. It's the easy way. That is why the Buddha made that path. You know, so for allowing people to really focus on that one 
uh, one letting go. There's, as you've heard here, renunciate, but please, I always get in trouble when I sort of really sort of start to praise renunciation and monasticism because then all these people, they say, yeah, I agree with you, Ajahn Bob, can you please ordain me? I say, well, where? It's even in Perth, as soon as you build a monastery, it's full. There's always waiting lists, literally. Now, the Bikuni Monastery in Perth, Dhammasar, it's a beautiful monastery, but even that is full. Every time you build something, it's full. So, you know, sometimes it's, ooh. So sometimes, please help get monasteries going quickly so you can ordain in them. Or in a kids' camp or something. So we can have a beautiful, especially Bikuni monasteries. How would you advise working therapeutically with people who have suicidal thoughts and perfectionism? <laughs> They're pretty much the same. <laughs> Because I saw an article some time ago that perfectionists, some of the ones, they're the ones who get most depressed. And sometimes I read this article where, first of all, this <coughs> therapist couldn't believe it. There's a woman, she was so perfect in life, really successful, had a wonderful family, good career, beautiful and successful and how come you're being depressed? Because perfectionism means no matter how good it is, it's never good enough. Perfectionism is people who always see the two bad bricks in the Great Wall of China, which is a huge number of bricks. <laughs> Perfectionists is they're writing an article or writing an email and then they have to keep reworking it because it's never perfect enough. <coughs> if someone who wants to write a book but they keep on reviewing it themselves, it's never good enough. It never lives up to their expectations. The person who <coughs> meditates can never let go enough because they're never good enough. Perfectionism is the problem. So we change our idea what perfection is. And they change the idea to perfection. You're already perfect, it's good enough. You're a human being. What are you trying to be different for? So we take away that idea and change it, revisit it. So this, how do you reckon Pearl State Bridge? Is it a good retreat centre? Perfect? Yeah, <coughs> make it perfect. Because otherwise you always have to keep on improving it, keep on finding its faults, keep on trying to fix things up. And that is endless, this is good enough. So, to me, perfect is good enough. And when it comes to suicidal thoughts, it's, yeah, that's one of the things about, if you really are a Buddhist, you can't commit suicide, it can't be done. Because as soon as you, you kill this body, you're still here. And you know, that's something which is incredibly depressing. You know, you're trying to solve all your problems by killing yourself, and after you've actually killed your body, you're still here get reborn again. It doesn't solve the problem. In fact, it makes it worse. With no God, I can't do anything right, I can't escape. So, remember, <coughs> suicide is not the answer. And, next thing is, this is, uh, as a monk you do actually get around to conferences and things. One of the things with suicide, if you see anyone who's really depressed, and they're thinking of committing suicide, and you know, that for days they're depressed, and then you see they're happy again. They're at peace. That's a warning sign. It doesn't mean they've sorted out their problems. It means they've made the decision. They're going to do it. They won't tell you. So I remember that was, wow, oh, what a interesting observation that was, because sometimes you'd be going to a good friend, going to a counsellor, and you're talking to them and they're really depressed and suicidal and then they come and finish with your, their consultation and then they're happy. So it seems. What it really means is they made the decision, they're going to kill themselves. <coughs> but, 
Sometimes you just can't do it. There was one of, uh, there was a caretaker at our temple in Perth. And he decided to, you know, retire. And he bought himself a caravan, moved out to the town of Beverly in the Wheat Belt, quite a ways away from um, the town. And <laughs> living by himself, sorry, <coughs> he got depressed. And no one to really talk to by himself, more and more depressed. And so one day he thought, right, that's it, I'm going to do it. Kill, kill myself. So he actually went into his shed. He actually got the rope, tied it to a rafter, tied the noose, and then uh, got the chair just the right height. And uh, so it was all prepared. Then he went into his caravan where he was uh, writing a suicide note. He was in the middle of writing it. And then what happened? He had the, the radio on. And it just so happened that the radio said, well, now we have an interview with the Buddhist monk Ajahn Brahm. <coughs> And this poor fellow, his name was Phil, he said, oh no, I can't commit suicide, Ajahn Brahm won't let me. <laughs> <laughs> he came very close, but then sort of he realised, you know, that it can't be done. So he came and apologised to me. So he said, if you hadn't been on the radio, Ajahn Brahm, I wouldn't be you. So anyway, so suicidal thoughts, it's just a bit of depression, and it doesn't really help because you're there afterwards. And no one's perfect. Look at me. You know, one of the reasons I make sure this rope falls off every now and again, I make sure that um, I tell the same joke about once or twice during the retreat. <coughs> so I make sure I'm not perfect. If I was that's one of the reasons why, you know, someone was asking, was, is it okay to get angry? If you're a monk, yeah, because sometimes it's okay to get angry if you're a monk, because otherwise the other monks would feel so inferior in your presence. Mm -hmm. So out of compassion to them. <laughs> or whatever, anyway. So anyway, just be your non-self. I was going to say be yourself, but that's wrong. See you not so. Thank you very much, Ajahn Brahm and Venal Chanda. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Excellent. <laughs> you know, I deserve that. That's another little interesting piece of advice to you. I was, so many, how many years ago now, I forget now, but I was given this, uh, this award from one of our local universities, the John Curtin Medal for uh, community service, leadership, and vision. And I didn't know why. Because community service is what you do to get out of jail. You know, they, instead of giving you sentence time, they give you so many hours of community service. Vision, I have to wear glasses. <laughs> leadership, most of the time I do what I'm told. <coughs> <laughs> 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 no, it's not true. Maybe. But, <laughs> so what are you giving me this for? And then they had to go for the medal ceremony and they awarded me and told me just how wonderful I was and all that sort of stuff. And I rejected it. And I, when I went up there to see the medal, so it's very nice to say these things. But, you know, there's many more people in the community who do much better work than I do, much more valuable. And also, I couldn't have done that without the help of all my friends, fellow monks, nuns, lay people. No, I can't do that without them, but thanks anyway. So I received the medal. And the next year, there was this um, uh, oncologist, Professor Jofi, from, he's now at um, uh, Fiona Stanley Hospital. He's the head oncologist, he's a wonderful fellow. But anyway, he was uh, at uh, Sir Charles Gardner Hospital. I know he's still at Charlie Gardner's Hospital, a teaching hospital. And he was head oncologist, teaching people, uh, helping people with cancer. And then he noticed that when you have the chemotherapy, radiation therapy, surgery, you actually <coughs> just given that, but no real aftercare, no kindness afterwards. <coughs> and so what he did, he used his position in the hierarchy of the hospital actually to chuck a few people out of some rooms 
and turn it into an alternative therapy centre. Got a sponsor and anybody who's having um, treatment for uh, any cancer related illnesses, they could go after that treatment into this alternative therapy centre and get Reiki, reflexology, homeopathy, acupuncture, uh, Chinese medicine. He said, anything weird, he said, you can get in there for free. And all his colleagues who were hard nosed medical scientists said, This is crazy, there's no evidence to support this. He said, No, I'm doing it. He put his reputation on the line. Because one thing he knew was that it didn't matter if foot massage worked or Reiki worked, somebody was giving you personal attention for 30 minutes and being kind to you. <coughs> Just focusing on you, talking, being kind. And if nothing else works, just that kindness and focus on you, caring for you, that does work. And of course he did the follow-up research and it was very convincing, conclusive research that those people who went into that alternative therapy centre had far better remission rates than those who did not. <coughs> and because that really rhymes with my understanding about the nature of the body and the mind and how to keep healthy, even when there's sicknesses, I thought, what a great guy that was. And I was there at his ceremony, and when he came up to receive his medal, he said, I don't know why you've chosen me. There are other people who do much better work than I do, and I couldn't have done this anyway without all the people helping me. And I said, that's my speech last year. <laughs> and I realised it's everybody's speech. When everyone says, well done, what a wonderful thing you've done. How come we always refuse praise? We just don't accept it. So, oh, no, no, no. It's, there's other people much better than me. There's other people that are much better work than me. <coughs> and I couldn't have done it. It's not me, it's all the other people as well. But then I started, why is it you can't receive praise? If someone criticizes me, Ajahn Brahm, that was a terrible story you said yesterday. That joke was just not appropriate. I said, oh, yeah, okay, I'm sorry, I won't say it again. <laughs> I accept criticism, but I refuse to accept praise. Why is that? And then I reflected, there were some actually really smart people in that university who did their research. And they decided that I was worthy of that medal. Was, certainly I thought that doctor was more than worthy of getting that medal, put his reputation on the line for that. So I realised that many of us, if we say thank you, we say well done, well done Venerable Chanda for organising this retreat and managing to twist my arm, it's just so hurting to come to this eight day retreat here. No, 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 not me. But you do deserve the praise. Well done. Thank you. And don't go around saying just all the, the support staff, blah, 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 all the other comfort. Because that's what we do, we try to sort of push away praise. It's not good for us, it's not healthy. So next time someone praises you, look at them and say, thank you, I deserve that. Why is that funny thing? Because it's unusual. So, accept praise. <coughs> Dear Ajahn Brahm and I, and some people say, if you accept praise, you'll get a big head. You don't get a big head. You get a big tummy. <laughs> no, you get a big heart. <coughs> Ajahn Brahm and I, Chanda, thank you so much very much for a truly fantastic retreat. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> Having learned this much from an, an, any other retreat, I haven't learned this much from any other retreat I've been to. Wish both the Venables good health and long life. That's an oxymoron. Good health and long life, you either have one or the other. Long life, you've seen people with old age, they can't remember anything. And you've got all sorts of... That's why, sort of, I rebel sometimes when people actually when you're old, they say, you know, how's your bowels, how's this, how's that? Why do all people always talk about their illnesses? 
<coughs> anyway, please kindly consider opening a retreat centre at the Bikuni Monastery too. <laughs> yeah, I'll think about it. Those of you who know that sometimes it's so hard to say no and all the reasons why this is not the right time for it because we haven't got a Bikuni Monastery yet. So we have a retreat centre there. So what I usually do, and so people actually also invite me, I say, can you come over to Poland to give a retreat? Can you come over to Ireland to give a retreat? Can you come over to Sweden to give a retreat? Can you come over to, to uh, uh, Norway to give a retreat? Can you come over to... And if I say no, they argue with me, say, why? You know, so we should do that. There's lots of good Buddhists there, blah, 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 blah. And so, to have a simple life, I always say, all right, I'll think about it. I've been thinking about many invitations for about 20 years now. <laughs> but I'm still thinking about it. So I'm not lying. It's just diplomatic speech. <laughs> I shouldn't give away my trick, should I? Otherwise, if I keep saying I'm thinking about it, <laughs> then you will understand that it's a tit for matter of Yeah, I know, it's just it's a trouble. Could Buddhism be seen as a form of philosophical nihilism? It could be seen in a lot of things, but that's not right seeing. You can see many things. You can see me as a fat monk, but I'm not a fat monk. I told many people before, this is confirmed not to be fat. It's a big heart. <laughs> 44, 45 years I've been a monk. And every time, every year you're a monk, you increase in your compassion. You learn more and more kindness. Every year your heart gets a little bit bigger. And now my heart, a long time ago, was so big it pushed against my ribcage. <laughs> and a, another couple of decades it pushed down and the only place it's got to go is out. So this is not a sign of uh, fat, this is a sign of a big heart. That's my excuse and I'm keeping to it. <laughs> so it can be seen as all sorts of things. Philosophical nihilism. Someone once asked, is Buddhism really a religion? I was asked this on uh, ABC News, on ABC Radio in Perth, and I shot back, Buddhism is a religion, for tax purposes anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Philosophical nihilism, you won't get anywhere that way. During the last meditation, my chair started to make creaking noises he had never made before. That's because the food at this retreat centre is so <laughs> delicious. <laughs> You've been putting on weight. <laughs> Check it out. <laughs> on hearing that, my mind got quite obsessive in wanting to understand the phenomena and I couldn't get any peace. How to let go of obsessive, obsessive thinking? Ah, uh, just sometimes it's if you get sort of obsessed, just go and find out why. I've already given you a solution. You don't need to always find the answer to things which have really not got any, any um, real relevance to the past. The old curiosity killed the cat. That's one of the reasons why I told the story of those the old wooden door, the silver, the iron door, the silver door and the gold door, behind which was the most amazing music ever. And I said, I can't tell you that because only monks can know that. Why do you want to know that anyway? So what? That's not going to make you enlightened, but it really makes you curious. So, there's some things you don't know, need to know the answer to. Hey. Oh, what's this? Another little story of the, uh, an old monastery over in the Himalaya mountains. There was an old monastery in the Himalaya mountains and the old abbot died. So they had to elect a new abbot. And, you know, the, the new abbot just takes a while to learn all the, you know, the rituals and stuff. 
And the new abbot was never as strong in his deep meditation and, and powers and stuff. So, you know, the, the new abbot, the young guy, had to sort of fake it a bit. So, when the rest of the monks, they asked one day, it's coming up to winter time in the Himalayas. <coughs> you know, the old abbot used to always predict so accurately whether it's going to be a cold winter, a mild winter, or a sort of uh, an extreme winter. So, Venerable Abbot, let us know, is it going to be extreme? Because this is important, we have to collect some wood. If we don't collect enough, we'll be in big trouble. So, can you let us know, is it going to be an extremely cold winter, an uh, ordinary cold winter, a mild winter, <coughs> or, you know, quite warm? Because the old abbot was always accurate on that, so the new abbot said, leave it to me, I'm going to meditate tonight and I'll let you know in the morning. So when all the monks were fast asleep, he got out his cell phone and rang the meteorological office. And he got through to the professor, you know, anonymously, and he said, what's the forecast for this year in this part of the Himalayas? Is it going to be a lot of snow, a lot of cold? And the professor said, well, it's going to be reasonably cold, we think. So, following morning, the, uh, the new abbot said, I discovered last night it's going to be a reasonably cold winter, so you better go out and collect some wood. So they all went out for the next week, collected lots and lots of wood, and then, after really getting quite exhausted, collecting all that wood and storing it, they asked, is this enough? And he said, leave it with me tonight, I'll let you know in the morning. And they all thought he was meditating, but he got on his cell phone again. The professor, hey, uh, how's it going? with a forecast for this part of uh, the Himalayas. Is it going to be really, really cold, or is it going to be mild? And the professor recognised the voice, oh, it's you again, but he didn't know it was the monk. You again. <coughs> the signs are, it's getting worse. It's going to be much colder than I thought. Thank you. So he said, I've discovered that, he didn't say, he made a phone call. He said, I discovered that it's going to be more cold than I thought, so you better go out another week, collect some firewood. So they all went out much further, you know, humping this firewood all over the place and stacking in the monastery. They said, this is enough. Leave with me tonight. And they all thought he was meditating, but once they all went to bed, he got out his cell phone, rang the professor and said, how's it looking? He said, look, the signs have got much, much worse. It's going to be an extremely cold winter. Thank you. And so <coughs> he told all the monks to go out again, get lots more wood, and the monks were getting a bit fed up with this. So after another few days they said, sure this is enough, leave it with me tonight. I will meditate, it was about, he did meditate, and I'll let you know in the morning. So he <coughs> meditated to keep his peace <coughs> and and in the morning. <coughs> so after meditation, he rang up the professor. He said, how's it going? And he said, the professor said, look, all the signs I've never experienced, never uh. seen so many signs that this is going to be an extremely bad winter. It's going to be very, very cold. And the monk asked, are you sure? He said, yes. Well, how do you know? Well, because the monks at the local monastery <laughs> have been collecting so much wood and the abbot's never wrong. <laughs> uh, the fellow who sent me that story said, that is how Wall Street works. <laughs> the blind leading the blind. <laughs> anyway, that's a nice story. Dear Ajahn Bhav, you recently made a distinction between the term stream enter and the stream winner when telling us about a story of some assassins deployed by Devadatta and a king in a bid to assassinate the Buddha. I think you said something along the lines that a stream enter is someone who is destined to become a stream winner before the end of his or her life. Are these two different words in part for stream enter and stream winner or some other language construct to distinguish between the two? Sometimes they're different words, sometimes they're the same words. <coughs> That's the problem. Because the Buddhist texts 
are not like a legal document where all the words are really specified for one thing. For example, they've got um, uh, long view number eight. This is in the Saman, uh, in the, uh, the, the net of views. What's it called? The Brahmajala Sutta. And he said, that which is called Jitta or Mano or uh, Vinyana, he said, anyone who says that's going to be permanent, last forever, and not go to cessation, means that's finish. He said, that's wrong view number eight. But what I was really interested in is just they say, people use it mind or consciousness or uh, <coughs> heart. We use it for so many, you, we use words uh, loosely. So sometimes we say, no, your mind, my, this is the mind sense, or this is mind consciousness, or this is heart. We don't use words sort of uh, precisely. And the Buddha was talking to ordinary people, not to lawyers or linguists. So he recognized that even in the suttas, sometimes we say words and they have a, a rough meaning. They're not specific. So the same with stream winning. Sometimes you use them in a <coughs> in a um, looser way. Or is it simply that Bhante personally opines that if we understand stream enter to mean someone who is destined to become a stream winner, then that would help in making better sense of stories like the assassins reaching the first stage of enlightenment? Yeah, yeah, it's the only real solution which makes sense. <coughs> and it's uh, consistent with the way that the party is used. Just like when I mentioned the, um, in the jhana, uh, word of the Buddha today, that <coughs> the Nala Kapada Sutta, it's only after jhanas that the five hindrances together with our weariness and discontent do not invade the mind and remain. And the first of those hindrances is called abhija, not the karmachanda. Same word as is used in the uh, Satipatthana Sutta. So you think the consistency, they'd always say the first hindrance is karmachanda, but they don't. Sometimes they call it abhija, sometimes, karma, sometimes they call it karmachanda. Words are used you know, as people would understand them, but they're not specific in the sense of <coughs> philosophically precise. In jhanas, jhanas, the hindrances are temporarily suppressed. How do you p ad abandon the hindrances permanently? By becoming enlightened. And how do you realize anicca, dukkha and anatta, i.e. what type of meditation or contemplation do you have to do? Eightfold path. So you do the Eightfold Path, it's not just meditation. Meditation is important. You have to have all the other parts of the path as well. <coughs> when you have all the other parts of the path, then the uh, illusion, or rather delusion, I call, I, uh, I was like calling the Awija, not ignorance, because that's the first, you know, the, the root cause of the problem. Awija, the first part of dependent origination, Awija, Pachiya, Sankara. But what actually is Awija? Ignorance is something you can overcome by going to university and studying and getting lots of knowledge. It's not ignorance, it's delusion. And even one place, Sariputta, said, you know, what is actually delusion? And he says, what the enlightened ones say is happiness, the others say is suffering. What the others say is um, suffering, the enlightened ones say is happiness. Example of that, spending eight days you know, of your own holiday time and paying for it, you're coming here, sitting on your bum until it's sore, <laughs> not having any dinner in the evening, not being able to speak, Crazy! That's suffering. Not being able to have any, like a, a a wine in the evening or something. You must be crazy. 
But anyway, there was, uh, some of you know uh, Australia, one of the wine growing regions in Australia, Margaret River, they came up with this very interesting wine. And it's you know, for medicinal purposes. Because, you know, it means they you know, get to my sort of age and sometimes you get up to get up in the middle of the night to go to the loo. And it really, really sort of you know, disturbs your sleep pattern. And they've discovered this wine, which is, uh, it's, it solves a problem, it's the perfect wine for elderly people. And <coughs> it's based on the, the very well-known wines, um, Pinot Noir, I think it's called, and Pinot Blanc. And this is called Pinot More. <laughs> Tell you a joke. Pinot Blanc, Pinot Noir, it's two famous brands of wine apparently. This is called Pinot More. Pinot More. <laughs> I really have to work hard. <laughs> so anyway, that that uh, you ban the hindrance permanently, and when you ban it, ban the hindrances permanently. Actually, these things are very easy to see. When I was in Bold Gaya, there was a monk from Australia who is the abbot of a monastery in the forest tradition north of Thailand. He was, sorry? Ajahnachalai. Ajahnachalai. <coughs> he was sit with this, he would sit with this disciple's followers and meditate non-stop for two hours without, in front of the stupa. Ten hours. Mm -hmm. They did not move at all. I checked a couple of times. So were they in jhanas? Or is it a special meditation technique? they used to stay still. Mike from Australia is the abbot of a monastery in the forest in the north of Thailand. I think that's Ajahn Sorry? It's Ajahn Okay. Can you sit still for 10 hours? He's got a nice website. He's beyond suffering. Okay. He does pilgrimage to India. 10 hours? Sorry? 10 hours meditating without moving. I don't, I don't know about that. They just bow to sit for many hours and so on. Okay. I don't know if they've been doing that really. Okay, yeah. Which is good about it on that website. Okay. Because sometimes monks, they do sit and then they move and then they stay sit for a bit longer. I'm not sure. I don't really know him. After death, with all four jhanas for the experience of the light nimitta? No, no. <coughs> you see the light. No matter when you die, you go to the light, but many people don't even go into it. Some people do, but you know it's very scary. So when you can do it here, then you get some practice. So you know exactly what to do. Or also, is there a difference between death and jhana from the mind perspective? Yep, but you come back again. In other words, the death, you're gone for a while, many years sometimes, and the jhana, when the jhana fades, the body comes back. But the experience itself, when you're in there, will be pretty much the same. What are the three kinds of... What's this here? The three kinds of something, something. <laughs> <laughs> Crikey. Please be kind. <coughs> Is that in Pali? <laughs> Similar? Misconduct. I see kinds of misconduct. One mis thing ill will, aversion, delusion. And if so, is good, something, good conduct, letting go kindness and wisdom. Yeah, so this is the causes. Uh, three kinds of something, misconduct. misconduct. Uh, what's it? Wanting, oh, aversion, delusion. It's not so much of misconduct, but the causes for misconduct. Sometimes you want something and you just cut corners and you get it and it's at the expense of other people's happiness and well-being. Delusion, where well, it was mine anyway, so, you know, why can't I get it? The opposites, so letting go, kindness and wisdom, of course, that's the opposite. So if you do those, uh, <coughs> develop letting go, kindness and wisdom, you're liable to have very good conduct. 
I love your translation of the word of the Buddha. I would now like to start reading the suttas. Could you recommend a good place to start? Yeah, um, the word of the Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, you can get some of the, the, um, the talks done uh, on, uh, by Bhikkhu Bodhi, in the written publications, or Ajahn Bamadi Sutta Central. So, have a look at those ones, first of all. A good English translation tradition. Every English, trans every English translation will be slightly different. And uh, hopefully that English translations, that's why on the front of my word of the Buddha I said it's work in progress. And always will be a work in progress. In other words, when is it going to be finished? Never. Because we always find new ideas, new ways of translating, better ways of organising the translations. <coughs> so we'll never find a final translation. But this one is sort of good enough for now. And also, the, the best way is actually even not to translate at all, but to learn a bit of Pali. It's not that hard to learn. If you're really committed to being a Buddhist, you know, just learn some Pali. If you've done any sort of work in anything like Latin or whatever, then it's quite easy. Anyway, so. And also, just check it out with your own <coughs> personal experience. What really makes sense? Do Ajahn Bar, I find Will Sankara needs getting used to, as usually Will is often translated also as ego or effort. Do they mean the same thing, just semantics, as Sankara is also mental formations? It is usually called volitional formations. In other words, even there, volitional formations, it's what you actually will to do. And that really opens up a lot of hidden Dhamma, which people haven't seen before. And it is smack bang according, according to modern neuroscience. Professor Libet, L-I-B-E-T, is really well worth looking at. He was a gentleman <coughs> who, uh, he was trying to find out, you know, what do people understand as will? And so he had a simple experiment, you would decide to flex your uh, fist, or close it up, flex it, close it up, and when you were aware of your will to open it up, you press the button, when you decided to close it, you press the button. And allowing for reaction time, he wanted to find out when you were aware of the will, the decision, and the action, and also something which he had gizmos on the brain, there were parts that would always light up when you made that decision. What was the sequence? Which came first? And research after research after research, the readiness potential, he called it, which could be seen occurring in the brain, preceded what you take to be your will, and then the action happened. The point is, what you perceive to be will is associated with the action, but there's something which comes before it, which you weren't aware of. So, throughout our whole lives, we've been associating these two things, choice, and action. And we think the choice is what, <coughs> what um, triggers the action. But the truth is something a bit more uh, challenging for us. By the time that we are aware that we will something, what we take to be will, what we can observe to be what we call will, it's already happening. It's not the initiator of a process, it's part of the process. Yeah? May I ask this quickly, does that mean we would always make the same choice given the same circumstances? That's weird, yeah. A few times I really challenged this, and one day, when I had a free morning in our temple in Perth, <coughs> 
I'd just given a talk the night before on a certain subject, say the Four Noble Truths. And then I just realized I'd given the same title talk about three or four years ago. And I compared them. And I found whole paragraphs, whole sort of minute, two minutes, were word for word the same. And I really thought I was in control of my speech. That I could decide whether to say you know, suffering or, or um, dukkha. And it really sort of, you know, caused me concern. I really thought I was in full control of what I was saying. And the other thing which caused me concern, again, when I was a student, when we did do <coughs> experiments in hypnosis, when we did, because a bunch of guys, we managed to, we didn't really mind making fools of ourselves. So one guy was hypnotized in the audience of about this number of people, and the hypnotist, it was actually this Tony Cornell, and he told this um, uh, student, when I touch my right earlobe, you'll stand up and sing the British National Anthem in a loud voice, no matter what people are doing, you finish the British National Anthem. We thought this was a joke, you know, it wouldn't work. But then, he took him out of hypnosis, and then during the lecture, he touched his ear, and this student, stood up and sang God Save the Queen from beginning to end <laughs> when all the students were almost weeing ourselves with laughing. It was the most funny thing, <laughs> jeering at him, but that, nothing stopped him. He went from the beginning to the end. We thought, what a ridiculous thing to do. And afterwards, the, when we all quietened down, he asked his student, what do you do that for? And then he gave a cogent reason a logical reason why he did that. And that's when I got very scared because I thought that he should have known that's a ridiculous thing to do. But he thought <coughs> it was an act of free will. We knew it wasn't. He was conditioned, brainwashed. Now you know how marketing works, advertising. You know, all advertising is like stupid things, usually. And sometimes you think, I would never get sucked into that. But you do. Every dollar spent on advertising usually gets three dollars back. That's why I already <coughs> told the story of the, the suicidal spider before to raise funds. And people think, suicidal spider, that's just a joke. Who would believe that? It's called marketing. There was this one nun who, I used to, this one nun, I think I did a distance before about the hypnotism to raise no, funds. Here. Not here. There was a <laughs> nun who started a temple, but you know, she did sort of have the experience to give really uh, engaging talks. So she was very, having it really hard to pay the bills. So she went to her teacher, and the teacher said, Oh, so easy. Next time you give a sermon in your uh, temple, close the windows. Make it very stuffy. Turn up the heaters. And give a boring sermon in <coughs> a monotone, no coughs. Boring sermon, really nothing special, slow and low pitched until all the people in the audience are falling asleep. But once they then get out your fob watch. Back, watch the watch. <laughs> until they're all hypnotized. And once they're all hypnotized, then you give them the this the saying. Before you leave you must put donation in donation box. No coin no fivers or tens or twenties, only fifties. That's the highest denomination, isn't it? I was trying to find out the other day. In, in British currency, 50 yeah. pounds? Yeah. <coughs> only fifties. Euros is even better. He said, I can't do that, that's fraud. And the nun, so uh, the monk replied, Oh no, that's allowing, encouraging people to do good karma, it's, it's okay. 
So she tried it, it worked. Her donation box was stuffed with 50 pound notes. No coins, no 20s or 10s. <coughs> and so, she thought, next time I need some money, I know what to do. So, this is just advice not to follow. <laughs> <laughs> So the next time she needed some money for the temple, she closed the windows, made it really warm and stuffy, gave a boring sermon, and then when they're about to fall asleep, sort of got out her fob watch, and she was just swinging it backwards, you all feeling sleepy, you're going to, and then she dropped it and it broke. She said, oh shit. <laughs> and that's what they did. <laughs> so was <am> I. <laughs> Sorry? Basically, no. Because you get brainwashed by monks and nuns like me. It's scary stuff, isn't it? <laughs> Associating with the wise is a great blessing. Having Kalyana Mitta is the whole of the path. Really scary stuff. But you ask any sort of uh, neuroscientist and said, well, yeah, you know, free will. You are influenced. Much more than you think. What? So, anyway, having told those jokes about donations, it's amazing how well it works, even if you think it's just a joke. <laughs> weird, isn't it? I know that somebody, uh, they went to this uh, guy, the hypnotist, uh, just for, uh, for fun, you know, a bit of entertainment. And these are people I know because they were Buddhists and they said, I ah, just you know, don't believe in that sort of stuff. And he said to them, he said, you're sitting down, you can't, you can't get up, try to get up. And they couldn't, just on a chair, he said, try to sit up. They couldn't do it. They said, amazing, sort of, how People can take over your will. Is it really free? Is it conditioned? Be careful. That, but that really scary stuff. So don't worry, you're very safe here. We've got goodwill. <laughs> Christmas time. Goodwill to all beings. Ajahn Brahma, I'm still dealing with the topic of forgiveness. A man went to war and who he became back when he became back mistreated and abused his children and today even their grandchildren work on their trauma. How can we relate to this? Thank you so much for your teaching. My own father will never talk about his father, my paternal grandfather. And I didn't know why, but you know, as I grew older, you know, I sort of confronted him. He said, why do you never talk about my paternal granddad? He said, no, you know, he's my family, I need to know who he was. You know, he died during the Second World War. My brother eventually found out it was from tuberculosis, you know, not from war injuries. And one day my father just opened up. He said, your paternal grandfather was a bastard. And my father never talked like that. And it, it was obviously really a lot of pain in there. And what was going on? And what he said was, uh, he was a plumber really poor, depression years in Liverpool, and that whenever he had any money, he just went to the pub and got drunk. And when he came back, <coughs> he took off his leather belt, he would whip any kid who came in his path, and then set upon uh, my father's mother, his wife. And my dad said, you can see just the pain, you know, that memory, he said that he could take the whipping but what he could never endure was to see his mother being beaten for no reason whatsoever. And he said that was just so hard to endure, but he made a resolution that if ever he survives and has kids, he would never hit them. And that's what happened. He was, couldn't do anything. It wasn't sort of, uh, you know, just, oh, it's okay. But he learned what it was like, and he never revisited that abuse on my brother or I. 
sometimes, you know, we deserved it. And sometimes you'd come up with a slip and you just couldn't do it. You know, you just stopped. It was a, wasn't in his genes anyway, just, no, I, I'm not going to do that to my kids. It's wonderful just, you know, that there was an example, a personal example in my own life, where abuse stopped. He learned what it was like to be abused. And he didn't want to do that to others. It doesn't always have to be revisited again and again in the cycle. Sometimes you know what it feels like. You know how much it hurts. You never want to do that to anybody. <coughs> it's not just forgiving, it's learning. And the learning is one of the most powerful parts, so you don't need to do it again. What do you say to people quite a few <coughs> What do you say to people, quite a few these days, who deny the existence of anything beyond the material realm, claim that all mind functions have a physical basis? You tell people you may not believe in reincarnation in this life, but you certainly will in your next life. <laughs> and it's, what to me is that it's in willful ignorance, actually not willful because you're conditioned to do this, it is ignorance of the facts. The evidence is there, it's out there. This you know, really nice, um, educated um, young woman came and said, look, I really love you know, Buddhism. All your talks have been so helpful in my life. Meditation is great. But the one thing I don't like about Buddhism is reincarnation, because there's no evidence for it. And I really argued with her at length. What are you, have you looked for the evidence? Have you actually examined some of it? And I gave a whole list. Uh, things like um, uh, the great Professor Ian Stevenson's uh, works. And just before Ian, I've got a, a copy of his signed books over in our um, library in Perth, because one of our, my friends went to see him. And before he died, he was quite miserable. And he said the reason was that you know, he was a very good researcher a um, very good psychiatrist and he did this research so uh, <coughs> so rigorously but what surprised him is it was not accepted any other subject it would have been accepted but because of the subject matter people just did not want to look at the evidence for reincarnation or rebirth. The evidence was solid. <laughs> but it was not because of proof, it's because they did not want to believe it. It was the, the um, what they call the ripalazas, the delusions of the, so the perversions of perception. It doesn't matter what it is, if you don't want to believe it, you wouldn't see it. If an alien from Mars, with tentacles, the whole works, came into this hall right now, you say, this is a joke, this is an illusion. <coughs> That's why sometimes if aliens did come, they'd be wasting their time. This is a marketing ploy, isn't it? A marketing ploy. It is, it is just a fantasy. Aliens don't exist. So there was a, an alien ship which came down outside the White House recently. And the alien came down and said the only thing which they knew, take me to your leader. And a fellow who they approached and talked to said, yes, I'll take you to my leader as long as you take him back with you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway, I jump out of chakras. Are the effects created by body, physical and the mind, etheric, astral, not that it matters anyway. Chakras, no, they came way after the time of the Buddha, but if it works, use them. They're not really necessary. Anyway, okay, you've got, is this a monk or the nun? They've got the big bear anyway, the little bear, or the middle bear, why? And the small bear is nothing. Anyway, why? Nothing. I think that must be Ajahn Chah asking the questions. Why? 
Anyway, it's nothing. How do we learn forgiving? Just knowing that there is no quiet for me, it is still a task to learn. How do we learn forgiving? Forgiving is like part of, of loving kindness, part of renunciation. Why do we want to actually... Oh, what a nice little story. You may have many stories like this, but the one which really sort of uh, inspired me, and I've said it a lot, was um, during the, uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, done in South Africa, led by Nelson Mandela and Archbishop Tutu. And they got Nobel Prizes for that, and they actually deserved it. So they realised that the only way to get some sort of progress and peace and harmony in South Africa was not to actually to punish the offenders, but to have some means of forgiveness and reconciliation. So they passed an amnesty law, as long as, no matter what the crime, <coughs> you confessed in public, in detail, telling the truth, then you would not get punished. You would walk free. And part of that, one of the transcripts which I read, was where there was a black African, black, no, not black, a white South African police officer was confessing how he tortured and killed one of the, um, the black African um, ANC activists. And you have to excuse me for what I read there because it gives you some idea of what went on. They say they took the, the guy disappeared in the middle of the night and this uh, police officer, South African police officer, took his penis, nailed it to the table before interrogating him. Show that just his intent. Now, any males here, just that just sends shivers down your, your body. And he, the police officer who was describing this, <coughs> was describing it in front of the man's wife, the widow. She had seen her husband disappear in the middle of the night, never knew what happened to him. And the police officer had to describe in detail how he tortured and killed this fellow in front of the widow. And even the police officer was shaking and with remorse so hard to actually to admit what he did. And when his testimony was finished, the widow jumped over the barriers, very strong, fit, avoided the security who was supposed to stop this happening and just went straight for the murderer of the man she chose and loved, the father of her children. And she wrapped her arms around him and said, I forgive you. Immediately after hearing what had happened. What that did, and the reason why I say it, is if a person can forgive that, why can't you forgive much lesser hurts? It just raises the possibility of forgiveness to levels you never thought were possible. She meant it. With that little act, there was hope. Hope for freedom. Revenge, the Buddha said, <coughs> revenge leads to more hatred. Forgiveness leads to love. Hatred never ceases through hatred, it only ceases through the love, which is part of forgiveness. So when you see great acts of forgiveness like that, it just raises the possibilities of how we can forgive. Unfortunately, what happens in our world, we just eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. <laughs> Being tough on crime. Zero tolerance. Where does that get us? Anyway, could you please can, can, could you explain please the difference between 
when you use the word the mind, and how is this different when you use the word <coughs> awareness? Is it the mind is the big consciousness and awareness is the manifestation as we connect moment by moment to the experience through body, mind, etc. <coughs> it's, we use words loosely. So consciousness, as I mentioned, there are six different types of consciousness. Independent, that's why I use the word consciousnesses. That actually changes the ball game when you use different word, consciousnesses. Not one consciousness. So what is the most important of the six consciousnesses? It is the mind consciousness, otherwise known as the chitta, the mind. Remember I made that point, what is the mind? And the story of uh, Jeff's daughter, uh, grade one at school, first year of primary school, What's the biggest thing in the world? And she had her eye. I told that story, haven't I? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> and she said, the eye is the biggest thing in the world because my eye can see everything. Everything can fit into my eye. It must be pretty big. And I said, the mind is the biggest thing because the mind can see everything you, your eye can see. And everything you can imagine, it can hear, it can feel, it can smell, it can taste, and it has its own area of knowing. Everything that you can ever experience can fit into the mind. Therefore the mind is the biggest thing in the whole world. No, actually that's wrong. The world can fit into the mind. But the world, the biggest thing is the mind. Stop. And that's really <coughs> close to Buddha's teachings where, and even um, quantum physics, you need a mind to create the world. Without the mind, there's nothing to collapse the Schrodinger equation. How's the time going? Right, still got time. How can I tell if I was meditating or if I fell asleep, other than snoring or falling off the chair, of course? <coughs> How do you feel afterwards? Do you feel dull? Or do you feel really alive? Because if you're starting to get still and peaceful, after a peaceful meditation, you're really full of beans. Your five hindrances have been lowered, their intensity has been suppressed, and because you've been still, energy should be pouring into your knower. So if you're not really quite sure, you'll probably be the same. Dear Ajahn Brahm, there is no free will or free one according to the research I read. So what is the will? What is it that free to generate karma in the present moment? If you believe you have a, a sense of self, that belief, that delusion, awija, is the cause for the karma formation. So if you think that you're responsible, then you are responsible. You feel guilty and you take yourself to hell or whatever. So that is one of the reasons why it's a delusion. Where does delusion come from, Aweja? It comes from the five hindrances, they feed delusion. So you knock out the five hindrances, delusion vanishes, and then you can see just what the will is. I'm going through these quite quickly, because I'm getting a bit tired today and it's getting a bit late. Although you said that 2 p.m. guided meditation can be intrusive to some people, your voice guidance can be very helpful for many in that beginning. Can you please take a fox, please? It's a bit late for that now, isn't it? <laughs> <coughs> One of the reasons was just being kind to myself, because the first uh, few days of the retreat I was still um, very sleep deprived with um, uh, Jet lag, but that seems to be gone now. As soon as I get rid of jet lag, I'm going back to the east yeah. before I get jet lag again. It's crazy. <laughs> but I did actually read once, um, Queen Elizabeth, that when she travels, she still keeps the same sleep pattern as in England. So she goes to Australia, she sleeps in the middle of the day, apparently. So it's always the same sleep time, except 
once I was going to a, a big ceremony, a Commonwealth Day service. She being the head of the Commonwealth, I was invited to represent the Buddhists in Australia and it was in the uh, Anglican Cathedral in Sydney. <coughs> so there I was with a few other leaders of the major religions in Australia and just looking straight at the Queen about as far as you away. And I found out, I don't mind saying this, why she always wears big hats. And the reason was, I was watching her during the sermon by the, uh, uh, who was it? Pell, I think. No, not Pell, he's a Catholic. Um, Gentry. And it was a very boring sermon. He was trying to be impressed, but he did failed miserably. <laughs> and imagine the Queen, Elizabeth, you could see her head drop. As a Buddhist, I knew that was sloth and torpor. <laughs> but when it got to a certain point, the rim of her head, you could not see her eyes. You could not see that she'd fallen asleep. So the big rims of the hat were to show that she could have a doze <laughs> during all these ceremonies, and no one would see her eyes close. It's amazing the thought of trivia that is a bit of much. I would like your advice on a matter regarding my work. <coughs> I run my own business and hire subcontractors to do projects for my clients. One of these subcontractors, who also happens to be a good friend, did something that risked jeopardizing a relationship with a very good um, something client of mine, old client of mine. Since this happened about a month ago, I haven't really done anything as I have been too angry and wanted to wait although I was quite determined not to work with her anymore and this has been troubling her, me because I care for our friendship. Then yesterday you reminded me of the two bricks in the wall so I felt that uh, so maybe all is not lost but I need to address the problems, what should I do? You know, one of the, <coughs> one of the difficulties is separating out your friendships with your business. Because you know, people keep on telling me this, especially with your relations. Because if you have a business and you employ your relations or you give your relations a job, sometimes it's so difficult to sack the relations or to um, take them to court or you know, just to uh, tell them there's been some fraud going on. And especially if you lend money to your close relations. You never get it back. So be careful, just business is sometimes fraught. The relationship you have in business and the guidelines, the checks and balances, is only existing family members. So be very careful who you actually employ. And if it's a subcontractor and a good friend is something that risks jeopardizing a relationship with a very good old client, sometimes if Speech can improve upon the silence and do something, but sometimes there's nothing you can do. Speaking can sometimes make it worse. That's a difficult decision for you, but it gives you at very least learn. Learn from your mistakes. That just because it's a close family member doesn't mean that you, know, you should give them the jobs <coughs> or employ them. So good friends, subcontractors, as long as everybody knows the rules before you, you start, then you, and you apply those rules independently, whether it's a family member or not, then you uh, can protect everybody. Thank you, Ajahn Brahm, for the boundless generosity of your heart. Your teachings don't stop with me as I share them with all the time with my friend and family. That is breach of copyright. <laughs> <laughs> that is intellectual property theft. <laughs> of course we can. You don't own anything. You just give it out. Ajahn Bharat, thanks for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know my father always said I was good for nothing. <laughs> Dear Ajahn Brahm, what exactly is right view and right thought? Exactly, you'll find in that little book, what, <coughs> the word of the Buddha. 
in brief, right view is what leads to right thought. And right thought is what leads to good um, precepts, good virtue. And virtue is what leads to right endeavour. And endeavour leads to right <coughs> mindfulness. And right mindfulness leads to uh, jhanas. And jhanas leads to um, wisdom. So, that's exactly it. But I'm rushing through these now. What are the four nutriments? Can we have the party words? Uh, what is the party word for nutriment? Nutriment is ahara. The same word for food, ahara. And uh, the four nutriments already said is solid food, with it kabalinka ahara, just you know, coarse food. And pasa is for the sensory contact. Uh, will is... Is it Chaitan? I think it's Chaitan with it. And the uh, consciousness is Vinyana. You can actually look that up for yourself. <laughs> A friend has an online group which she calls the 100 Day Challenge. Oh, I think I've heard this one before. This is to assist people to meditate daily. However, isn't this also a form of craving? Craving to reach 100 to be perfect. He, also, he can also become a chore, not something that will lead to bliss. Yeah, but sometimes 100, you can actually say, like, can you count to 100? Okay, 10, 20, 40, 60, 100. So in other words, it doesn't have to be 100, but just it gets people sort of motivated to do a little bit of a work, but don't, if you only get 99, 98 good bricks in the wall is more than good enough. And so, I would actually encourage, don't have a number, but if you can just help one more person, just the one more person challenge. And do that first of all, and then one more, and then one more. So I always thought of trying to save the world, it's just, such a big um, ask that eventually you just give up, it's hopeless. But just to save one person. <coughs> and then once you've done one, do another. And the person you really help, always tell them that please do not thank me. But <coughs> if I've helped you, if I've helped any of you in your meditation over the last eight days, you're in debt to me. But don't pay it back with a bar of chocolate. That'll kill me. <laughs> Instead, sort of, if you're in debt to me, you've got to help somebody else. And when you've helped someone else to the same extent, and they say, oh, thank you so much, then you've got to tell them, no, don't thank me. Now you have to go and help somebody else. And that 100-day challenge, it doesn't finish when you've done your 100 days. It goes on and on and on, one by one. It expands. So I always prefer that. Say, help one person and tell them they've got to help another. It's like the pyramid schemes, but with actually much better results. Please can you share what you understood about David's being helpful in our everyday lives? David's being helpful in your everyday lives that sometimes Oh, they can. You have a good David story? The weather. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah. That was a good one. I was thinking more about the, um, the Deva in Wapawan. Is it? That's a, that's a amazing story. <coughs> Which one should I do? The Wapawan. Wapawan, because it's, the other one's more personal. So, there was this young um, Peace Corps volunteer. Uh, he had just finished his two years doing Peace Corps work and he was in a hotel just to the north of Bangkok and he thought that he wanted to complete his experience in Thailand by ordaining as a monk. He actually liked Buddhism, he'd gone to temples, did a bit of meditation, so you know he was thought this would be a good thing to do. And especially in Thailand, you can become a monk for however long, and then you can just leave. So, but he didn't know how to ordain, what you're supposed to do. 
So he asked the concierge in his hotel. And the concierge in hotels where foreigners go, especially Westerners, they know many places to go but not monasteries. So he just gave him really sort of some strange advice. He said, well, you know, I've seen in this monastery in the center of Bangkok called Wat Bo Wan, sometimes it's Western monks there. So you're a Western monk, try there. But what should I do? He said, well, get some, <coughs> get some food, go there early in the morning, when the monks come out on arms round, give food into the monk's bowl and then ask, now I want to become a monk. That's not how you do it, but anyway, he followed the advice. <coughs> he got some hot food, went to Wapa One early in the morning, and for him early in the morning it was about 4 o'clock, 4.30. And the place was all locked up. No one around. He was walking up and down, wondering what to do next, feeling he's got some bad advice. And then fortunately this uh, Thai man came to help him. Thai man could speak perfect English, a very polite, and said, what are you doing? He said, well, I, 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 <coughs> I want to become a monk. And I was told this is what you're supposed to do. And the Thai gentleman very, very kindly said, well, that's not the best advice, but never mind, you're here now. I'll take you inside just to show you around <coughs> while they're waiting for the monks to actually to finish their morning duties and then come out on arms round. So he had the keys and he opened up this, this metal uh, gate in Wapawan and went straight to the, the main ordination hall, the Holy of Holies, the Apostle Hall, the meditation hall, where the door of the ceremonies and stuff. And he opened the door, turned on the electric lights, and then on these um, Buddhist temples, Thai temples, they have all these murals written on the wall. And the Thai murals are like cartoons, but you, they don't follow just a, a rational path. You've got to sort of go this way, that way, all over the place. They're usually a jataka tale or a story from the Buddha's life. And so if you know the story, you can actually follow exactly the story. And this Thai gentleman was just so articulate and knew so much about these temple paintings, especially just why they were, they were um, uh, painted and who sponsored them. It could be for somebody's lost a, a, a dear old parent because of typhoid, or you know, a child died from malaria and they decided to make merit by sponsoring these paintings. <coughs> and the, the uh, Americans said it was amazing and just so fascinating and time flew past and the timing of this Thai gentleman was so accurate that when he finished the tour around the temple, he said, I'll lock up, you go through the gate, turn to the right, there'll be an old monk coming out in a few minutes, ask him. And that's what this uh, American did. And uh, the Thai monk said, just wait here until I come back from my answer and I'll take his time. And so that's how he started his training to become a monk. <coughs> but after a couple of days, the uh, American was getting a bit frustrated because the Thai monk who was assigned to him to teach him the chanting, the procedures, his English wasn't that good. And he was always getting a bit confused, you know, what he meant. So he asked, you know, can I have someone who speaks better English? And they said, this monk here is the best in the whole monastery. What about that temple attendant who greeted me the first day? What temple attendant? The one who opened up the gate and showed me around the... What are you talking about? There is no such temple attendant. That gate, and I know that gate well, I was in nine years in Thailand, that's the royal gate. That temple is where the kings and princes of Thailand all day. And that royal gate only royalty can go through. And only the other hand of peace, maybe a secretary. And no one has the keys, no lay person has the keys to open that uh, main hall. And it was so weird, they took him straight to the abbot, who later on became the head microtime in from the Yana Flangwell. And the abbot listened to this um, trainee monk and stopped him and asked for the secretary to come and write this down. And this is written down in the history of that temple because 
No one can go through that gate except royalty. No one has the key. No lay person has the key for that. You can't even turn on the electricity where he said it was turned on. And again, only a couple of monks have the key to the main hall. And not even the old abbot knew all the stories of those temple paintings, and especially who um, sponsored them. And when he finished his account, you know, in detail, everything written down, they asked him, well, what did that gentleman look like? Describe him. And he said, well, one thing which stood out, he was wearing old traditional Thai dress. He said, well, what else about him? Well, it was just, it's a Thai. I think he said something, please excuse me, well, you know, they all look the same. <laughs> and he said, tell me something about him, because it's really important. You know what sometimes people do to think, they scratch their head and they look around, and that's when he stopped. It was him. It was a portrait on the wall. That was, that was a gentleman who met me, that guy. That was King Rama IV. The monk, the king who sponsored the building of that temple, who was there when those paintings were made. So that was him. He didn't realize that that was a former king. That's why he could go through the royal gate. He was allowed. And that was, I checked that so many times, this, this story. I won't say who that monk is. I actually don't know if he's still a monk, but he went back to the United States as a monk. <coughs> and just like in the, the old uh, time of the Buddha, that king would have been a deva, heavenly being, would open up gates which didn't have keys for, turn on lights where there was no power source to. It described all of these amazing things to keep this America inspired until, until the end of the, uh, uh, the time came when the monks were coming out. Real Deva. It actually happened. I know the monk is true. The king died over 120 years earlier, came to help a person become a monk. Real the truth. Um, Okay, I'll, I'll tell another crazy story. What do you want? Dumb with tales. <laughs> I knew what you were going to say. Because there's the weird stuff. There was a monk uh, who was in Burma during the Second World War, and once um, the Japanese took over Thailand, then Thailand was officially at war with the British. And because the British were in Burma, any Thai person in uh, Burma at that time you know, had to get out quickly, especially the monks. Even though they were just Thai monks, they were looked upon as being spies by the British. And many of them were abused. Or even killed, I'm not sure. But Thai monks were just had to leave Burma fast. And this monk was a forest monk, who was an Ajahn Chorp. Yeah, it was Ajahn Chop, one of the, the old forest monks. He wrote about this in his biography, that when he couldn't leave by the, the ordinary paths, he had to go through the jungle. That was the only safe way he could go. And I've lived in that area of the Thai-Burmese border, and there is some very steep hills, <coughs> really sort of remote and rugged, hardly any sort of civilization there when I was there let alone in just uh, 1940 or 41. And so he had to go through this forest path, up and down these mountains, and there was no food, couldn't take any supplies. He was getting weaker and weaker and weaker, hadn't eaten for days, and hadn't seen any, any villages or anything. And he was really concerned that he was going to die on the journey, he wasn't going to make it. 
And that's when he remembered some of the, the stories, you know, from the, the time of the Buddha. <coughs> and he made a resolution, he said, if there are heavenly beings, he said, I'm a, I'm a good monk. You know, I'm keeping my Vinaya, I meditate. I'm not, you know, in this for just fame or fortune. I'm a good monk. If there are devas, maybe one of them can come and help me. And after making that resolution, he turned a corner of the jungle path, maybe you know, within a half an hour anyway, and he came across a well-dressed gentleman standing on the path with like, a tiffin can. You know the tiffin cans, are that trays, <coughs> metal trays, they call them binto in Thai, uh, where you put rice on the bottom, then some curries or something, and some maybe fruits in the top. And Buddhist monk of our tradition, at that time anyway, we're not supposed to stop and ask. We have to wait till we're invited. So he saw this gentleman, the gentleman wasn't speaking, and the monk went to walk past, and the gentleman put his hand up and said, Nimon crap, which is a Thai word for invitation to receive something. Nimon crap. And the monk was just really sort of wondering where the heck did this man come from? Hadn't seen a village for days. This man was well dressed. He hadn't sent an email off in front saying, I'm coming. <laughs> but this man was waiting for him. And when he opened his bowl to receive the food, it was hot food. Not jungle food, which was usually potatoes and animal parts. Real, good, nutritious food. Like it was just flown in from Bangkok, but there was no aircraft or helicopters in those days. And he took the food in the bowl, and they, the gentleman just put it in there. And he couldn't help but ask, which is what he's not supposed to do, where are you from? And the gentleman who offered the food never replied, except with his finger. <laughs> That's what he did, which was a symbol like from some heaven realm. And when he got back to safety, he told everyone else that this is really strange and weird. There's no other explanation. No villagers, no people dress like that. They use rags in the jungle. No food like that, hot, knew he was coming. There's too many sort of unanswered questions, except that that was a heavenly being. So, fast forward to um, 1978. And there was a young, thin, at that time, bald-headed English monk who was walking through the um, northeast of Thailand, through Pupan district, which even at that time, too, was very sort of undeveloped. I'd been walking all day. Oops, I let you know who it was. <laughs> <laughs> I'd ran out of water and was getting dehydrated, a very hot day. I was getting dehydrated, I don't know whether it was uh, <coughs> heat stroke or sunstroke, but I was feeling a bit wobbly. And I came up to a ridge in the hills, Pupan means like the uh, range of mountains in, in the northeast of Thailand, just south of Sakonakon, north of, of Kalasin, <coughs> for those of you who know anything about Thailand. And then when I was walking there, I came to a ridge in the mountains, in the hills really, and there was a village in the, the valley, about five or six houses. But from experience, I know that even though it was a small village, that one of those houses would be the general store. And in the general store there would sell matches, um, kerosene, cigarettes, uh, and also they would sell Pepsis. And so I looked down there and I said, I remember that story of Ajahn Chor. And I always wanted to find out whether there really were Davis, whether that story was authentic. So I made my resolution, I'm a good monk and you know, I keep my precepts, I meditate, I'm not going to give up this monastic life and I do really need something to drink otherwise I may even pass out. So I said, if there are Davis, 
No, please have a Pepsi. You don't get water, okay? That's just what they drink over there. The water would be, I don't know, uh, contaminated, but at least that was um, pure water with you know, sugar and I don't know what else they put in there. But I walked down into that village. I kept my eyes just two meters in front of me, just like when you do walking meditation. Very restrained, not looking to the left or the right, not saying anything. <coughs> But out of the corner of my eye, I saw the general store. There's a few people in there, but I walked right past it. No one paid any attention to me. And I thought, yeah, it's just superstition. David is heavenly beings. And as soon as I thought that, I heard someone running behind me say, Nimon crap! The words of invitation. I never said anything to anybody. When I turned around, there was an open bottle of Pepsi Cola. They wanted to offer it to me. That could have been a coincidence. But then another man came out and offered another Pepsi. And then a third. And then a fourth. And then a fifth. And then a sixth. A seventh came. Then an eighth. Then a ninth. Now anyone who knows Thailand knows the magic number, the lucky number, is nine. In Chinese it's eight. Her uh, career is always number seven. But number nine is a lucky number because it means the same as progress. No, gao, it means gao na, progress. And so I put those nine bottles of Pepsi, there was a bench, and I sat on there. And I said, you Davis, you don't mess around. If you just got one, that could have been a coincidence. But nine, that has only happened to me once, never again, never to any other mug which I know about. And there was nine bottles, all in a line. I drank the top of, you know, most of them. But I, no way I can drink nine bottles. And I gave the rest to some kids who were waiting for me to finish. Refreshed, and also, more importantly, knowledge that I tested out the existence of Davis. And they were there. Only when you need them, for a good purpose. Not otherwise. That convinced me anyway. And there is a few other stories as well. You only make use of those when it's really necessary. Not lightly. If you are short of cash and say to bank, can you ask the Davis for lottery number? Please, 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 please. No way. If it's, you know, your good friend has got sick, can't do it for that. It has to be some big, big things. So anyway, so the Davis, they do exist. The other, I do, the other story, about the storm, first of all. You now Ajahn Bamali is a good companion because, you know, he, you know, he's a skeptic. And he says, oh, this <coughs> chanting and stuff, is we have to do it, but, you know, what evidence is there for it? But there's one of the occasions, he was there and he said, Look, this is unexplainable. So he puts this down to, to Davis. And that's when we had our 30th anniversary of our Buddhist society in Western Australia. And at that 30th anniversary, um, I was the, the head monk, the abbot, and the spiritual director of the Buddhist society. So when our, our president said, we have to celebrate this, and I said, well, if you're going to celebrate it, do it properly. So don't do it half-hearted. Buddhism has arrived in Perth, let's go for it. It's my Leo nature. I was born in August, Leo, ah, war. Don't do anything half-heartedly. So, we said, let's see, what's a day? It was happened to be the Waysack day. Full moon day in May. And it was a Sunday when people had the day off. And I said, well, let's do it right in the centre of Perth, which was a place called the Supreme Court Gardens. Right in the centre, that's where big festival ceremonies are made, right in the centre of the city. So let's see if it's available. And they rang up and it was available, free. So let's go for this. So we, we huge organisation to get all this happening. And I was, uh, you know, just looking after everything and got lots of um, tables, tents, marquees, MCs, 
and we invited the uh, lots of um, uh, consular corps and also the, the then uh, Premier of Western Australia who was uh, Tony Blair's best man at this wedding. And so we invited him and we didn't think he'd accept, but he did accept he was going to come. Big event. Got the, tried to get TV cameras to come along. There's only one TV camera crew came along, but that was important. But in the morning of that day, we'd already worked really hard. It was pouring down with rain. And so we checked the weather forecast. There was a weather event. A huge storm was heading to Perth and it was going to hit, estimated coming at 7 p.m. when we we're going to start our ceremony. And it's a, not rain, but a storm. And so people said, oh, should we cancel? My positive attitude was, no way, we're going to go for this. And three times the Premier's office called me. <coughs> Are we going to cancel? No. We're going ahead. We had a fellow monk. Uh, he took me aside and said, Ajahn Brahm, you're embarrassing us. There's no way we can do this. It's a storm coming. Look, this is the weather forecast. No way we're going for this. We're going to do it. And also, there was a gentleman who was in the Merchant Navy most of his life. He took me aside as well. Sometimes I can be really stubborn. I can't be told. And it's good sometimes, not always. <laughs> so this sailor took me aside. Look, Ajahn Brahm, you now here's the, the uh, barometer. It's going, the barometer is going very, very low. I know this. This was my life. I was at sea most of my life. This is a major storm. You can't do this. You're embarrassing everybody. No way we're doing it. And I was <coughs> pouring down rain. Some of the people I used to, has got to go off to uh, uh, catch a plane. So have a good trip. But anyway, the, most people would get drenched, really soaked, putting out stuff, flowers and whatever. And I was in the VIP tent arranging the, the chairs when uh, this devoted elderly Burmese supporter, she said, Hacha Prabhu, you've got to come out, you've got to come out now. She was crying. And I thought, oh no, what else can go wrong? And someone slipped over and had an accident or whatever. And when she took me out of the tent, she merely pointed up in the sky. The clouds had parted. The full moon of Waysack was out and the rain had stopped. That's why she was crying, like a minor miracle. And the TV crew were following me around saying, this is weird, <laughs> this is weird, <laughs> this is weird. And the Premier came and the Thai ambassador came and most other people to the east, the west, the north and south, they never turned up because there, there was trees coming down, a major storm. And they thought, afterwards when we told them we did the ceremony, they thought, it's impossible. <coughs> we did it. And we had the, no rain when we were there. And the Premier sort of, you know, gave a talk. Other people gave a talk. We finished the ceremony. And after the ceremony was finished, the rains came down, flooded that field, flooded the freeway. I don't know any other time. I know it was... There was a burst water pipe once and it flooded, but this was because of a huge storm. We finished. We did it. And afterwards, that was one of the reasons actually why the Thai ambassador, <coughs> she made sure that I was awarded this Chao Kun fan because of that. But you know, at the time you can't sort of really appreciate it. That, you know, there was a huge storm which was stopped. The people who hired out the tents, got an email, it was passed on to me the next day. We don't know who this Ajahn Brahm is, but, but can you please ask who's going to win the horse racing today? <laughs> <laughs> They're really impressed. But the following day I had to go off to Melbourne to, to do their way sack for them. And you know when you do sort of lots and lots of work, you don't have the time to reflect on what's happened. So I had about three or four hours sleep after that and then got to the airport 
checked in, sat in the corner and wept. Something amazing had happened. I hadn't time to get inspired. But then I thought, wow, these devas are something special. You know, when you really need them to do like Waysack Day, anniversary of the Buddha's birth and life and death, and it was our 30th anniversary of our little organization. I had the confidence and faith, and we did it. The rain stopped in time. You ask Ajahn Mahali, he was there. But this is what happened. It's amazing. I'm never afraid to weep for good things. Beautiful, inspiring. Wow, what this world can do. Anyway, that was one of my favourite, sort of, because I was there and part of it. And what happens? Ooh. So any scientist who starts saying, oh, this is only the brain, you're missing out on so much. <coughs> so much inspiration and so much, ooh, things which sort of blow your mind. And I was a theoretical physicist, but those things happened. You were there. So anyway, have a nice night's sleep. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Well, talking too much. Okay, have a good night's sleep and have some wonderful dreams if you wish. With heavenly beings protecting you, keeping you safe.